Welcome to the SeizeYourBusiness.com podcast and video blog. My name is Kevin O'Flaherty from O'Flaherty Law, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Jim Wazak. Hello, everybody. And Jim Wazak, Zeal Financial. Thanks. And uh, we have Tom Herman today from CRO Roundtable. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Tom, and, thank you for being here. Welcome. My pleasure. My certainly. Pleasure. Certainly. And, and today we're going to discuss prospecting for customers, which every business owner cares about. So we love these topics. We always love topics about building your business. So, so Tom, tell us a little bit about your background and what CRO Roundtable is and what you do. Yes, thank you. So uh, my background is uh, four decades plus in sales, sales management, uh, service delivery, and executive management. So after for some decades, um, frankly, I decided I didn't want a boss anymore. Uh, I so, feel that. <laughs> <laughs> so I stepped out of uh, the, the corporate world and brought the executive roundtable to Chicago. So that's what I've been doing the last couple of years, introducing the roundtable uh, into Chicago. Mm-hmm. So tell us about the executive roundtable. What is it and what's it, what's it good for? It, well, it's good for a lot, but uh, CRO roundtable stands for Chief Revenue Officer. So whoever is the driver that's responsible for revenue at a company, and some it can be the um, president, the owner, might be a VP of sales, it might sure. be somebody, and I, it depends on how a business might be configured. Somebody is responsible for growing the revenue, Mm -hmm. and that's who we target at the roundtable as potential members of a roundtable. So we're looking for those people that say, we got revenue, but we know we can do better. Mm -hmm. Okay. We just don't know how to get there, right? We're running 24 by 7. We're all, you know, why not, right? And so we work with small, medium, mid-sized firms to help them understand where are the gaps and what they're doing that can make them more effective, more efficient, and drive a larger amount of revenue. So a question, Tom. Um, In a lot of businesses, it is, as you say, the owner or VP of sales or something like that. But in some professional firms like accounting or law, uh, usually the partners are all independently responsible for driving revenue, would those people be appropriate members or not so much? They potentially could be. We, you know, we, uh, when, when I describe who the members are, the reality is uh, it goes from uh, I'm a Ph.D. who bought these two patents from um, the, the, the uh, university, now what do I do with them, mm-hmm. right? Or, true story, we just got divorced, and in the settlement I got the business. Now what do I do? Right mm-hmm. or uh, you know, I, I just need to find more opportunities. I need to prospect. I need more sources of revenue. How okay. do I get there? So mm-hmm. we have companies. The largest company that is a member of one of our roundtables is actually a billion and a half dollar company. Mm. And uh, the, the reason they're there is not that they don't have processes, procedures, and staff to do all these things. I would describe the owner of that business as the chief retirement officer who is looking to protect his investment and live well, Mm -hmm. but the person that's responsible for driving the revenue is looking at that it saying, you know, we're a billion and a half dollars, but if we're going to keep that billion and a half, we have to change things. Mm -hmm. How are we going to change things here and keep the revenue stream going? So -hmm. that's why they're there. They're there to look at and get ideas for how they can re-engineer parts of the business and keep that revenue stream rolling. So at one of your meetings, you're basically, it's, I assume it's kind of like a guided discussion that you're, you're leading where the members share ideas about particular topics? or how that's, that a, that's a part of it. So we follow the business year cadence, right? There are times of the year when you're budgeting. There's times of the year where uh, you're prospecting and then you're, you're adjusting your first quarter plan because... You either got too much or didn't get enough. So there are different times of the year when different things need to happen. And we will follow that. But each of the members will share what's their number one, number two objective that they need to accomplish in the year. And we'll let the topics that we bring, whether it's an outside speaker, whether it's a drill down discussion, uh, or uh, uh, again, a round table thought process uh, is driven by those, that, that cadence and the targets that each of the uh, members will have. So, 
So, so Tom, uh, I guess I'll ask this question. Uh, prospecting can be done, obviously, a lot of different ways, depending on the type of business and who your target market is right. and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but I just wonder, are there any common themes that you might offer as a, as a tip to somebody, you know, that would apply to just about every business? Well, uh, from my view, right, and, and my view, again, is from a history of experience in doing it, watching others doing mm -hmm. it, seeing all this happen, and watching the turnover that happens either in business failures because you read the statistics that talk about how many businesses don't make it after five years, or you take a look at a sales force and how the turnover of a sales force happens, who's successful, who's not successful mm -hmm. in that process. So my thought is most people do it wrong. They just, they don't approach prospecting customers correctly, they don't think about it correctly, because the reality is nobody wants to be sold. Mm -hmm. The fences come up as soon as they hear, hi, I'm so-and-so and, -so and uh, I sell pens, mm -hmm. Wh whatever it is, right? Now the barriers are up. Yep. And so you can do a lot. If you just do a high volume and keep going and keep going, you can probably sell some pens mm -hmm. in that type of an example. But what people want is to do business with somebody they know, that they like, and eventually they come to trust. So approaching customers, prospects from a, how am I, I'm here to help you. How can I help you be more successful? How can I do something that makes the world better for you uh, is a way of opening the door, generating the conversation, finding out what they need because they can still be a prospect even if they're not going to buy today, tomorrow, sure. next year. You need a pipeline. You need, a, you, you need that backlog of potential. Uh, and they need to think positively about you, whether it's your business, whether it's your, you as a sales rep. They have to have a good feeling for all of that. So if you, if you were to approach prospecting from a how do I help you versus how do I sell you, mm -hmm. number one, it makes the prospecting more relaxing. It makes it more interesting. Uh, I don't know if I use the word fun, but I think mm -hmm. perhaps it could be. Um, and, and the barriers don't come up in that process. To do that, you have to be pretty confident. You have to be confident in your product, in the service, uh, the, uh, the, the things that you do for, for people in your business. And you have to really understand how you stand out from the competition. What's unique? What's so special about you or your product that they lose something if they don't choose you to do business with? So I guess the way I want to um, kind of in, interpret that is you want to have a level of confidence so you can kind of mention what you do or how you help people in sort of a, I don't quite want to say a cavalier, but in a sort of relaxed manner, feeling confident that if they have a potential need, they're going to see the value and at least want to talk to you further. That's right. And, and I would suggest that the best way to do that is to tell stories. Love it. All right. If you're telling stories. Yeah, that's right yeah. up your alley, Jim. He, he, he's there, huh? Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep, I can tell stories. I mean, Some of them actually are true. You know, and, and the reality, yeah, well, <laughs> the reality is they don't have to be your story. Right. 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 They might have to be from somebody else in your business, somebody else that has actually done this successfully somewhere. And you can relate that story saying, you know, we have a customer or we have people in your industry that we've helped with this and with this. And, and, and you know, we've, we've found a lot of very rewarding business, yeah. you know, that way. And, and for somebody to say, you know, I, I had that problem. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, they're opening up. They're asking you yeah. to do more with them. So it, it's, it's that ability to relate. Again, it, it's that no like, trust mm -hmm. stepping stone for, for working with people. You know, uh, Kevin and I chuckle a little bit because I do some volunteer work as a career coach, and one of the things I do is a workshop called Ace the Interview Through Storytelling. Yeah. And it, it yeah. always is very uh, very powerful and, and very helpful. So, yeah, absolutely, stories are terrific. It's not easy. 
for, mm -hmm. you know, people don't like to practice those kinds of things. They read them, they think they got it, but you really have to internalize mm -hmm. so that you understand the story, you understand the benefit, you understand why you're telling this story, not just coming up with something that, that came out of the, the sales manager's uh, mm -hmm. book, if mm -hmm. you will. And, uh, and, and if you come across with it that way, people are going to warm to you and, and they'll remember you. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, one of the things that we work on, we use the term intromercial as a part of the process, right? Okay, good. It's, like it. it's, it's an introduction. Some people call them elevator pitches. It's really a commercial. You, when you pull all that together, it's what can you say in one or two sentences that will stick, mm -hmm. that they'll remember. Okay. And uh, one of the best examples of, of all the people that we've been working with, uh, it was, was, was an attorney, right? He was working for a large company, and the position that he was interviewing for was compliance officer, right? So it's like you meet the guy someplace, maybe at a holiday party or, or an event, what do you do? Well, I, you know, and he'll go down this litany of legal terminology of yeah, the things that he does, right, right. you know, and they're looking for somebody else to talk to very quickly. They mm -hmm. want to, they mm -hmm. want to move on. <coughs> After working with them, what he came back with was, what do you do? Mm -hmm. My job is to keep the CEO out of jail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Much more powerful. Right. Yeah. Really? Well, how do you yeah. do that? Yeah. Right. Right. Now, now it steps exactly. into the, so it, it, that's the kind of. Uh, of infomercial that again it grabs their attention they'll never forget that right next the next day they're going to be talking about you know who I met I met a guy who keeps the CEO they, mm -hmm. they know that sure and sure. so um, it, it, it's a way of uh, building that uniqueness that makes you special mm -hmm. that that um, nobody else is offering out there in the market hard it's hard to do that because when you make that statement and then they say how do you do that? You have to have those answers. Sure. And of course, those, it has to be true. Right. You have to be able to prove it, right? And it has to be relevant to the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And, and you know, Tom, you, you, you touched on another thing that uh, has been another interest area of mine, believe it or not. But you said about how, how some people are kind of uncomfortable with that, that storytelling mode. And I, I see this both in business as well as in the career work that I do, but you know what's a really good idea for those people? Take an improv class. I do some improv uh, kind of on a part-time basis, yep. and uh, people that have gone through classes, uh, it's just amazing that they just get much more comfortable being spontaneous, they get much more comfortable with themselves, and, and it's fun. Sure. So, you know, another, uh, another simple idea that's fun for our viewers is, uh, is improv. Improv would be a great way to go. Toastmasters is another way mm -hmm. to learn how to just speak off the cuff on, right. on something quickly and easily. So th th those kinds of things, if people haven't done them, especially if they have that stage fear, if you will, whether mm -hmm. it's one-on-one -on -one or a group, um, it goes a long way. Sure. It goes a long sure. way with people. A couple points that you brought up that I really agree with are, you know, you need to have confidence and especially if you're just starting you're not going to have confidence i mean you've got to it, it, it some some of that comes with experience some of that comes from you know taking an improv class right but you got you have to have confidence because people don't want like you said a pitch people don't want to be just feeling like they're the recipient of a monologue that you've given to 40 other people that week right they want to feel like they're just having a conversation with someone and off the cuff is another good point you know if you're going to tell a story i think it shouldn't feel like it's a pre-prepared story. Exactly. It's got to be, hey, right. you know, I, based on what's going on in your situation, I remember a time that I had a similar situation, but it's got to seem like it's, and it should actually genuinely be an off-the-cuff story based on the actual conversation you're having, right. not a pre-prepared spiel, because a spiel will turn people off so fast. Yeah, and, and so you have, to, you have to know those, you have to internalize them, uh, it takes time, right? It takes off hours work to do that. You mm -hmm. know, if, if, if you have a significant other, you can bore them to death with practice mm -hmm. on, on how to do that until you get fairly good at it. But you're right, it has to flow, it has to be comfortable, you know, because if they think they're, that you're processing through, oh, here's the point, and then you go, you know, they're, they're not buying at that mm -hmm. point, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're looking for somebody else to interact with. So to me, it's, uh, if you're going to be uh, a business person, if you if you have to be always prospecting, 
but if that prospecting is done the wrong way, it's really frustrating, it's mm -hmm. really hard. If you're doing it the right way, looking for a way to help people, how to relate to people, how to share successes that you've had before, the doors stay open. And you can continue to work with those people down the road. And God forbid, they might actually give you a lead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that could happen too, yep. because yep. you're memorable, because they had, they had a connection that made sense. And people love stories. I mean, you know, we watch TV all the time. We read books. I mean, people just love a story. Can you give Absolutely. us one, one or two more tips or easy fixes, common mistakes that you see people making in, in the sales process or a couple of things that people can instantly apply? Well, uh, I guess the, the first one I would say is too many give up too easy. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they give it a try. They try something and it didn't work. They try it two or three times, it didn't work. You know, and, and psychologists will tell you it takes time, it takes repetitive behavior to, um, to establish good habits along that line. So sticking with it and, and uh, looking at the small results, not the big results, right? Most of them are, are you know, did I make a profit this month? Did I, did I hit my sales target sure. for the month? I mean, those are, you, sure. you know, but typically you don't get there right away. All right, it, it takes time to, to build up. You don't do anything so, well the first time, typically, so, in life. Yeah, so persistence is, is the, the main thing. that the, If you're going to be at, good at it, you've yeah. got to work at it. Yeah. Right? You, you have to feel good about that. So, Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot a little yeah. bit here. Yeah. So uh, you and I are uh, at a, you know, a business uh, workshop, and we've got a break, and I say, Tom, so, so what do you do? So I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> oh, good. That's what I want to hear. I, I grow your revenue. Oh, beautiful. That's, 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 that's what I care about. How, how do you do that? Well, I do that by understanding what you're using for your tools, your process, your procedure, mm -hmm. taking a look at where there might be um, some, some gaps that can be closed, and working on those with you to improve that process because it's, it's all there. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, we'll we'll take a look at, you know, are the right people in the right place? Uh, what is the message? Mm -hmm. what, you know, I, and that's one of the things I listen to with everybody. You know, I shake hands. What do you do? I, I, I'm listening for, am I getting all that uh, legal leads, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. Or the or the tech talk, which you hear so many times these days. And if if they're doing that, then they're missing the boat. They're not relating to people on a level they can relate on. Uh, they should be relating on. So I'm going to be looking at that message, looking at what's unique in the business that we can help them stand out with, mm -hmm. and uh, and talk with them about different approaches. I mean, the follow up is the second piece to that, right? You, I meet you one time, and I, I go away, and you know you right. didn't you didn't buy. So so, but how do I follow up with you? How do, how am yeah, I meaningfully dealing with um, keeping in front of you, being a part of your mind? in that process. So Tom, if uh, someone wants to reach you to join CRO Roundtable, how can they, how can they find you? Well, they can find me uh, through LinkedIn, through uh, Twitter. They, they just have to, you know, put me in and, and Google me if you want to do that. But it's T Herman at CROroundtable.com okay. mm -hmm. or www.CROroundtable.com. Uh, and uh, and cell I, phone? I, I, I'm sorry. Cell phone. Cell phone six three zero seven three zero eight seven one eight. And and I'd love to talk to them. But we have a we have a really good time. There's only a couple of little rules in the roundtable. First one is, no competitors at a roundtable. Mm -hmm. Everybody is unique in their business, and if you're trying to c talk about an issue needs fixing, you don't want the competitor writing mm -hmm. all that those notes down so and then the other one is uh, we have no dress code okay so everybody comes for the rest of their day and we work on the topics for a half a day and uh, everybody goes away with something to act on super Jim what are you doing these days and how can people reach you? yeah well I'm with Zill Financial and it, as Tom says the uh, simple one-line statement is I protect families from the indirect costs of cancer, heart disease, and serious injury. And you can reach me at 
1-800-273-3895. And Kevin, how do people find you? Yeah, you can call me for a free consultation. We do almost every area of law. My phone number is 630-324-6666. Uh, you can check out more of our podcasts and videos at seizeyourbusiness.com. I do a legal podcast you can check out, our, hundreds of articles on every area of law, learn-about-law.com. We've got a new real estate podcast I'm doing called makingrealestatefun.com. Uh, Tom Weiler is responsible for our videography. He does a great job for us. You can reach out to him if you'd like a video. If you're a business owner, he does lots of videos for business owners. Uh, WeilerStudios.com, Weiler with a Y. So, Tom, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Tom, great thank time. you very much.